Hey everyone, I'm Ron Johnson. This is Locked On Sports Minnesota. We have Sam Ekstrom. We have Luke Inman. So you know what that means? It's Friday. It's the Friday football roundtable. And we got to jump out there. Some some uh, some bad news, uh, depending on who you are. Some can consider it good news, but some bad news last night for Ed Donatel. He was let go uh, from the Minnesota Vikings. It was a move that had to happen. It was just a piece of the puzzle that needed to be moved out. So let's get out there quick, fellas. Uh, Luke, when you saw the Ed Donatel news, uh, what were you thinking? The scheme has worked throughout the NFL plenty of times for years and years. So I can't sit here and say it was just the scheme that was the problem. And when you look at some of the film, especially in that Giants game, there's multiple plays where you just have no idea what these guys are doing. Guys are way out of position all over the field. It's just a mess top to bottom. And so bringing in a guy like Vic Fangio now isn't something that I have a problem with. Some people are saying, well, you got to tear the whole thing up. I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I think if you can implement that same scheme and maximize each player's skill sets and talents it can work you could see a huge improvement next season after just one offseason and coaching switch especially think about this you're getting four defensive guys from last year's draft class combined with this year's group of draft picks that's a lot of talent and youth and speed infused into the defense mixed with hopefully some key veterans that can still be brought back I think this defense can still play at a high level, but clearly, Ron, Ed Donatel and that dead last worst defense in the NFL, he had to go. A switch needed to be made. Sam? Yeah, I said this on the football party yesterday. Uh, the worst defense in the NFL gave up 392 yards a game. That's Detroit. And the Vikings defense gave up 400-plus in seven of the last 10. That's a stat that you've talked about a lot, Ron. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if there was any kind of upward trajectory. They weren't getting better as the season went on. In fact, they were probably getting worse. Um, and by the end of the year, they were playing just as poorly and porously as they did week two against Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. When we started talking about this, that was the first sign of the defense struggling. And we thought, well, with more time in this scheme, they'll figure it out. And they never did. And it seems like maybe a, a, a bad coaching job on Donatel's part for not fitting his guys into the right places. And, and Ron, you use the analogy square peg round hole. Mm -hmm. I think that's really good. I think that's exactly what this was. And But as Luke said, I would be surprised if they blew the whole scheme up because I think they, they built this scheme with guys like Scene and Booth and Asamoa and Evans in mind. I think they would rather have the young guys have that continuity instead of the veterans, because the veterans like Smith and Kendricks and Peterson, they might not be around too long. I think they keep developing their younger guys in a similar scheme with a different coach behind it all. Yeah, I totally agree with that, too. Um, my, my first thought was that square peg round hole. Uh, and, and that's how I also felt like Ed Donatel. When you look at this coaching staff, you look at the makeup of the coaching staff. Even if like if we were just to go have a dinner party with the Vikings coaching staff, uh, Ed Donatel to me still feels like a square peg around, around a group of coaches that is not really what this organization is about. Not to say he's a bad guy. He's just he's different. He's older. Um, you look at Kevin O'Connell. You look at uh, Wes Phillips. Uh, you look at the defensive uh, coaches, you look at the special teams coach, like it just has a younger Rams type of makeup. And then Ed Donatel was just, and, and again, now let's not forget Wade Phillips, you know, who was with the Rams mm -hmm. and they bought him in to try to win. So it does work, but, but Wade Phillips reminds me of Rex Ryan. Like I think Rex Ryan would have no, I, no problem fitting in with this group. I just feel like Ed Donatel, uh, he's a little bit past his prime. And so, and, and in coaching, Again, you can coach like Tom Moore, who coached my dad when he was in college. He coached for the Steelers when Tony Dungy was there. He still he was coaching at one point for the uh, uh, Buccaneers. So I don't know if he's still there as an assistant or not because I know I saw Clyde Christensen and a bunch of other coaches I've coached with the, the coach retire. So who knows? Uh, but when you look at even that fit with them. And so here's where I go with this. The defense. Going into the Bears game, because you can't count the Bears game. They were 31st in yards given up, which was almost 400 yards a game. 31st. They were giving up almost 26 points per game. That's 31st. And basically 275 yards passing per game. That was 31st. You have an offense that's fifth in passing, seventh in points scored. So the biggest problem with the point score being seventh, 24.7 points per game the offense was putting up, and the defense gave up 25.9. So if you were to say that to somebody, most people that don't know the game of football or the Vikings story, they would say, oh, yeah, the Vikings had a losing season. No. 
They went 13 and four. They won 11 one score games and they got the doors beat off of them in a couple. And that's why that point differential is so bad. Um, but when you think about those 11 score games or 11 games, sorry, one score games, that was all offense. So if I'm Kevin O'Connell, this is something that had to happen. It had to happen fast. Uh, I think people would have questioned his leadership skills if he didn't do it. Uh, because then it's like, you're just, you're okay with just being mediocre. You're okay with just getting by. Um, mm-hmm. I think this shows early in his regime uh, that we we love our friends, we love our people, but we're not going to hold on just because uh, we feel good about it and it feels like something we should do. Uh, this is a business. Even though it's a sport we love to watch, it's still a business. And I think this was Kevin O'Connell's kind of – he had to put a stamp mm-hmm. on the end of this season, and this was a sign, sealed, deliver. Let's move on to the next season. Uh, and, and my one takeaway, too, from this is – I knew about this. I got the text like, hey, can you do a Vikings video for Vikings.com? So I knew, and I didn't tweet it out like Adam Schefter. So I want people to know. I can keep a secret. So anybody you want to <laughs> want to send me some secrets, We people, all wondered. Let huge, me know. Huge send me some secrets. Hey, send hey, me some secrets. Just real quick, to both your guys' points, I look back after that second Lions game. Remember that? That was the point where they had allowed like five straight games of over 400 yards. And KOC, you remember yep. he came out and he was like, all right, everything's on the table. Mm -hmm. And you started to see them play a little bit more man, use different personnel packages. They even started to dial up the blitz a little more often. But then it was almost like they started to regress back to the starting point again. I got to think that showed KOC that there's more significant changes that need to be made than just these little tweaks that they tried to do throughout the season. Yeah, and I think it was key, too, that they didn't do it in the press conference. Everybody's like, man, I wish they had just said in the press Mm -hmm. conference. I think they owed them more than that. You yeah. owed him a little bit more respect than that. You owed, you know, you wanted to have time to think about it. I think they truly wanted to give it time to really sit down and think about it. Because when you want to fire somebody, I mean, you're at home thinking about it. What can we do next? And if I'm a survival guy and I'm like, look, my $5 million a year, my six, $7 million a year is on the line. Okay, I got to make this. I got to do this. And him at Quasi, I think that's why you're going to see uh, moving on to the next topic. I think you're going to see a lot of players that fans love and that they've known for years not be here because this is a group that doesn't have that heart connection with these players like these they're walking into a house and they don't know these guys it's literally like getting married and your wife's kids show up and they're grown so you're like look if we get along great i love y'all i want to hang out with y'all but if it doesn't work (laughs) out hey i married your mom i didn't marry you you are not my blood you are my wife's kids. And so I, I think that's what people are forgetting. Like the human element of like a, a Rick Spielman who had drafted a lot of these guys, bought these guys in. That's why a lot of these guys got extensions, got held on to uh, the heart. Like, oh, man, I really love this guy. But you, you got two coaches or sorry, a GM and a coach. They don't know these guys. And the owners are going to stay out of the way. They're like, look, you need to put your team together. So I go with this. Adam Thielen's wife, and and there's a long post she had. And to sum it up, basically she's saying she's proud of Adam. God put them in a position that they never could believe. This ride has been crazy. He was undrafted, as we know. He's from Minnesota, grew up loving the Vikings, Randy Moss jersey type stuff. Her comment that everybody's probably going to question, because I haven't even looked at the comments. This happened last night. It says, it's a fairy tale ending. Uh, or almost like a fairy tale story. She said, I know how bad, here it is, I know how bad he wanted to win a ring here in Minnesota, and I'm praying there's still a chance, but there's no, there, he, but here's the closing to another healthy and great season for Adam. And so I think that is what's going to, you know, and then she goes on saying, you know, I continue to love watching you grow as a player, each person in the season, blah, blah. But I think that's where people are going to go. They're going to always look at that part, like, Okay, he wanted to win a ring here, and you're praying there's still an opportunity. Like, why do you feel like there's not an opportunity? And so I, I, I just think like we have to be human in this. Like, people will act like, oh, wives shouldn't say. Wives can say whatever they want. Like, she's just saying what she feels. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, does she want to be here? Yeah. Like, your kids were born here. You lived here. You have a house built here. You're from here. Uh, you know, your grandparents. Everything. Everything's here. So, can you afford to move? Yeah. You're rich. You can move and, and relocate. Look at Kyle Rudolph down in Tampa. Like We know that. But then Kyle's probably going to come back to Minnesota. But for her to make that comment, uh, where do you go with this? Do you really feel like now it's getting closer and closer where Adam Thielen is either going to have to restructure or you know get asked for other Vikings to restructure and get cut and then go out and maybe seek 
other offers and see what they have in case like, yep, cut me. I know some teams that want me. Or after he sees, he'll be back as a Viking with a, a smaller salary. I saw what you say. I've got a lot of thoughts going through my head. So number one, Adam Thielen's claim that he's healthy. Caitlin Thielen's message says that he's healthy. He, he's not, that's not a healthy football player. That's not, that's not what I watched all year. I would be more encouraged if I were another team or even the Vikings and the Vikings know his situation. But if I looked at him this year and thought, wait, that's you healthy. Well, that's going to make me want you less. If you came out and said, all right, I've been playing through this guys. I've had this knee contusion all year. I've had a sprain, whatever. Um, and it's going to heal up and I'm going to be a hundred percent next year. That's what I would want to hear. If I were going to sign Adam Thielen or restructure with Adam Thielen. Now, the cap is interesting because Adam Thielen is a, is a 19.9 cap number, which is huge, but it's 13 million dead. So if you want to part ways with Adam Thielen, if Adam Thielen doesn't want to take a pay cut, you still owe him 13. So is it worth that 6.9 million to lose that player? Because that's really what the difference is between what you owe him and what his cap number is if you keep him. Um, so that's a consideration. I feel like Adam Thielen has some leverage here because when the 13 million in dead exists, um, he's willing to say, Nope, I don't want to take less than that. I don't want to take less than that. I can, you can bring me down to 13. I'll play for 13, but I'm not going to play for less than you owe me. Um, so that gives him a lot of leverage in this negotiation. I can't imagine that he would want to play for like seven or eight. I don't think he's going to give him that much of a hometown discount. Um, so I think best case scenario is that they get that number down by six or seven million um, and then still eat that 13. And I don't know if they want to do that. They might just say, hey, to heck with it. Let's elevate KJ Osborne and eat the money and uh, and move on. There's no perfect scenario here. I mean, if you outright cut him 6.4 mil, I believe, if you restructure his contract, I think that only saves it like another mil, 7.1 million. So not really great outcomes for the risk, to be honest. There's something similar you could do just like they did with Anthony Barr. If you remember that one, you basically void out the last year of the deal. He saved about five or six mil this season. And while it's not a perfect outcome, it is the best of a tough situation where now you're still saving a good chunk of money and both parties can now move to this kind of one-year deal from here on out and reevaluate at the end of each season, much like the way the Patrick Peterson contract was set up too. So at the end of the day, though, perfect world, I think we all got to believe that the local legend, the UDFA from Mankato, he wants to end his career here in Minnesota. So figuring out, finding a way to get that done has to be a priority for both sides of the equation. In the process, of course, Quasi has to save some money to lower that cap number as well. Yeah, and, and I'll go with that. I love your take, Sam. That was perfect. Like the $13 million, I think that honestly probably is a great outcome for both sides. Um, you don't, you because you, you lose the money anyway. So I'm I'm a big proponent of use it or lose it. Like <laughs> I will like if it's a coupon or a gift card that's five dollars on it, I'm gonna use that five dollars. Even if I'm buying a hundred dollar item, I'm using that five. Like I'm <laughs> never gonna let money die out. Like I hate when I see I, I got gift cards in my drawer still because I'm like just in case. Let me keep checking to make sure I don't leave a dollar on this. Uh, I'm a down to the last minute guy. And so I, I love that take. So I agree. I'm going to piggyback that. I think that that's probably the best case scenario. Everybody saves face. Thielen still is a multi-millionaire receiver in that aspect of 13 million. Uh, you don't lose the 6 million uh, because, or sorry, you don't spend that additional six. So that does give you free up 6 million and go out and get another, you know, get some other pieces, but then you still have a piece. So then that other piece doesn't need to be a receiver. Because the problem, if you do cut them and you still are paying 13 and you still have to go find a receiver, you're not going to find one better than him for less than him. And so if you can get him, and then again, healthy, you're going to get him back healthy next year for 13 million with Justin Jefferson, probably elevated into a new contract, possibly uh, KJ Osborne as well. Um, you know, I think they can figure out some kind of deal to extend him and, and exercise his offers. Um, 
there's 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 a way to do this and then just really revamp the defense uh when you look at all the pieces they can have so sam you hit the nail on the head uh if there was a way to give you bonus points and, and confetti to fall down it would be over your head because <laughs> I, I think that is a very I, I love that scenario with the 13 million dollars and and not you know paying them the 19 but then also not just losing the dead cap money because then you look dumb like i think the vikings for years rick spielman them constantly cut the wrong people instead of finding ways to use them on special teams or whatever and then they end up just losing the money and now look at that's why the cap is where it's at um Next one, so talking about the cap and Adam Thielen and guys they can add, this is kind of the fun one. Uh, we, you know, I was going to have it at the end of the show, but I think this is the perfect time to do it. We have something coming up, people, that I think is awesome, and this is what we're going to do. The 2021 draft, when you look at the players drafted in 2021, the only ones that are really giving you anything for this team right now are Christian Derisaw, Cam Bynum, and uh, Kane. Wang Wu, like those personally, nothing against the other guys that were drafted, Patrick Jones and all those. Those are the only three guys I truly feel like are really just like because you have a kick returner, you have a starting safety, you have a starting left tackle. Like those are the guys that truly gave you value. And so if they were to go back, if, if Rick Spielman or if Quasey and Kevin O'Connor were in a year earlier and they were able to uh, draft that 2021 class, we're going to pick some guys that we think they could have drafted instead of the guys they picked. No shade, nothing against the guys they picked. Kellen Mond is not here. You didn't need a quarterback. Kirk Cousins is your guy. You should have went and got pieces of the puzzle. Uh, so we're going to do that. But before we do that, I want you guys to remember, you can dem download the Locked On Sports Minnesota app on Amazon Fire and Roku. Just go to your Amazon Fire or your Roku TV, click on your apps. There's a spot to add or download an app. Just search Locked On Sports Minnesota hit download. It's going to be right on your TV. You can get all of our videos, all of our shows, instant podcasts. It's going to update as you go into the app every time with every new video uploaded. Uh, and then we also have a word from our sponsors. Yeah, betonline.net brings us today's show as it does every single day. You can get all the lines, spreads, money lines, totals at betonline.net for the NFL playoffs. Go check out how big underdogs the Giants are at Philadelphia. See if they can pull the upset there. You can also get NBA, NHL, UFC, boxing, golf, every sport, every line at betonline.net. It's on your mobile device as well, and it's where the game starts. Back to you, Ron. Well, fellas, the 2021 draft. I'll start it out. This is what I thought, and I'm not going to go through my whole list, but I personally believed in the third round, Instead of getting Kellen Mond, they could have got a cornerback out of the University of Minnesota, starting for the Washington Commanders, went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Justin Jefferson in the red zone. Benjamin St. Juiced. Now you add a player that's going to give you not only probably a starter at DB, but for sure a potential huge backup uh, to kind of battle with Cam Dantzler. But... You look at the injuries that happened. He's probably starting the rest of the season. If not, he had already been starting next to Patrick Peterson. That's also your nickel. So now you have a guy that can jump into the nickel as well because of his length, his size. He can cover tight ends. So Benjamin St. Juice was one. Another one in the third round. And I'm going to skip over because I had Spencer Brown, right tackle from the Bills. He's a starter. But if you have Brian O'Neill and you have Christian Derrissaw, uh, Spencer Brown is probably is a waste because he is a starter. So now you have too many tackles. I don't know if there's ever really too many tackles. You can't bank on Brian O'Neill getting hurt. But my next one would have been two guards. Ben Cleveland, Ravens backup offensive guard. He's a swing guard, so we can go left or right for the Ravens. And then Quinn Miners, the guard for the Broncos. He is the right guard for the Broncos starting. Now the Broncos suck, but he's the starting right guy. He's the guy that was blocking in his yard. <laughs> for his video i don't know why but everybody wants to go viral he said i'm gonna go train and he goes out in the yard and starts knocking down trees and pass blocking and run blocking trees so i mean the guy is this move the guy whose belly was always out he had the midriff thing going on i think so i'm pretty sure that is him uh yeah. and then in the fourth round kane wong Wu and cam bynum i think were fine uh fifth round they could have had hafunga starting strong safety from the 49ers and literally i'm just taking a four or five picks that are behind where the vikings picked uh, they also could have got KJ Britt back up Bucks inside linebacker because they run, you know, this three, four, but according to the time they were four, three, I get it. So yeah, another inside linebacker next to Eric Kendricks didn't work, but it would have been nice to have another backer for special teams. that would have played instead of Chaz Surratt and some of those other guys. Um, and then is Israel. he even in the league anymore? Chaz Surratt, I don't think so. Chaz? Chaz? Really don't. 
I don't think so. But and then uh Israel Makuamu, cornerback and nickel for the Cowboys. He's been playing. I don't know if he's starting for injury or if he's just starting, but J. Ron Curse talks about him. Trayvon Diggs talks about him. So those are kind of picks. Uh, just my quick twitch, but jumping up to the top, I really think Benjamin St. Juice over Kellen Mond. That's what I would die on the hill for. I would stand on the hill and I would die to say we should have drafted Benjamin St. Juice instead of Kellen Mond. The Kellen Mond draft at first seemed sexy, but I mean, when you look at Kirk Cousins, it's never hurt. And, that, and that's why I truly believe if there was a coach here at the time, I truly believe in Kirk Cousins, they're not drafting Kellen Mond in the third round. They're going to go get pieces they need to make this team good, which was definitely defense. And we talked about cornerback, defensive back dry, uh, depth. Benjamin St. Juice can also play safety if needed. So there's your guy. What you got, yeah. Luke? Yeah, yeah. obviously you're not touching Darius on the first round. That worked out beautifully. No second round pick, as you mentioned. There's one guy you missed. I'm surprised you didn't take. If you would have taken him instead of Montserrat or Wyatt Davis, looking back, could have maybe changed the entire landscape of the draft. That's Amon Ross St. Brown. He goes in the third to the Lions. Yes. If the Vikings would have sniped him in the second, we'd be talking a lot differently about this draft haul because not only are you adding a top flight, young, emerging wide receiver, it's a double dip because you're taking that player away from a division rival, right? So now you don't have to play this guy twice a year either. Total win, double dip there. If you really want me to put my GM cap on here, I'm going to wheel and deal. I'm trading. The first two third-round picks, I'm moving up in the second. I'm taking Asante Samuel Jr. from the Chargers. Mm. I'm taking my last two third-round picks, and I'm trading up to the bottom of the second. I'm taking Creed Humphrey, one of the best centers in the entire NFL already. I selected to the Pro Bowl his rookie season. And having him on the Vikings interior line would have made a world of difference the last two years, not to mention Samuel in the secondary. Like you just said, can't have enough guys in the secondary. That would help you sleep a lot easier at night. But Amon Ross St. Brown, what a find for the Lions. If the Vikings could have sniped him with one of those four third-round picks, that would have been great. Sam. Yeah, so doing research for this, I came across an interesting nugget. I was looking at interior defensive linemen from this class, and I ranked them on PFF, all the, the interior defensive tackles, from the 2021 draft, and guess which one is most highly graded? Kyrus Tonga. <laughs> He's a Viking. Yep, so that up. doesn't answer the question, but I thought it was a good nugget. There are two guys below Tonga who the Vikings could have taken in that third round. Alan McNeil, Detroit Lions, Milton Williams, Philadelphia Eagles. They both had big years. Milton Williams was a rotational piece for the Philadelphia Eagles, that's a great defensive line that they keep stock, stockpiling. And he's an important piece of that. Comes in, 20, 30 snaps a game, gets the job done. He pressures the quarterback. And Alan McNeil, he's a little more of a full-time player for Detroit. Played over 700 snaps this year. Had like 29 pressures. The Vikings need that kind of penetrating three technique uh, rusher that they just haven't had a lot of. They've had some good run stuffers in the middle, but not guys that can really wreck the play in the backfield. I think McNeil has a lot of potential for Detroit, part of that very good Detroit draft class. Not just Amon Ross St. Brown, but McNeil, kind of a sleeper in that third round that was taken uh, right after that Kellen Mond pick. Yeah, McNeil's been a stud, man. Another guy, sixth rounder, who's been a stud for the Chiefs, Trey Smith, tackle from Tennessee. Everyone knew he was legit. He was legit like a top 50 projection, but he had major knee injuries, so a lot of teams wouldn't even touch him. Chiefs took a gamble on him. They came away with Creed, Humphrey, and Trey Smith from that draft, completely changed their offensive line. A late second-round pick mm -hmm. and a sixth-round pick. Just goes to show you, I mean, you just never know. That's why Ryan Poles lessons. got a GM job. I mean, Ryan Poles was unbelievable at, at helping with those offensive line picks. Totally. Yep. And another guy I would say, if this staff was in place, Chris Rump, the second, his mm. dad is a Miami. coach for the Vikings now. Mm -hmm. He is also with the Chargers, fourth round pick. He's the backup outside linebacker in a 3-4 defense. So, And he plays special teams. He would have been a nice depth piece to be your special teams linebacker, but also comes in on rushing downs, kind of a pair with Brian Asamoa. So he's another guy that I'm pretty sure the Vikings in the fourth round would have been like, hey, let's draft his son. Like, I, th I think he can play. Like, <laughs> so <laughs> that would have been another piece here. But no, I, I definitely, the Mile Round St. Brown, I looked at that one. The only thing that throws me off is they already had KJ Osborne and Thielen and, and uh, Jefferson. I so, feel like it's it's they just didn't like know cornerbacks. Good no, yet, you though. can't have enough. True, true. Osborne wasn't kind of the guy yet. 
Osborne wasn't the guy yet. You're right there. And then maybe you get Amara St. Brown with KJ Osborne and Adam Thielen. But maybe Amara St. Brown doesn't get a chance to shine because of Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen. Like yeah, he yeah. never gets to shine like KJ Osborne. He kind of just, you know, sits back and then, but you know, I mean, or you we have just under- come out uh, four wide every play. You have, and, and maybe, and, sh- well, you had Zimmer at the time, so that wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if Amara St. Brown could have been 2021 and then, yes, ended up in this offense, yes. They would have for sure had a murder offense, greatest show on mm-hmm. turf. Myra St. Brown, Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, and KJ Osborne. Oh Ooh. man, that that's that that would be nasty. That'd be a nasty defense right there. Um, Deami hey, Brown too is was pretty good in that third round. Deami Brown, yeah. I really liked coming out of college. I do like the Ashanti Samuels though. Like I, I do like that one. Like I like yeah, that trying to jump up and get corners. But we all kind of stuck to the cornerback thing, which is so funny because Mike Zimmer was known for just mm-hmm. drafting corner after corner after corner. And I feel like he read too much of Twitter. Like everybody was saying, don't do what you normally do. Don't go right. out there and draft cornerbacks. And I guarantee he probably would have done it if we hadn't have tweeted so much about him doing it. Yeah, he got in his head. We got in his head, Ron. Speaking yeah. of drafting cornerbacks under Mike Zimmer, all this talk about Lamar Jackson, will he stay, will he go from Baltimore, will he be traded? Do you remember who the Vikings passed up Lamar Jackson for and which player they took? I don't. Mike Hughes. Mike Hughes. Mm. Current Detroit Lion now. So that's a great That's a great segue. That's a, so let's talk a little bit about Lamar Jackson. So when you think about Lamar Jackson as a player, when you think about Lamar Jackson, there's a lot of stuff. One, the injury. Two, should he have played? Three, he's a free agent. So is it a value for Quasey and this team in the offseason to look at Mar- Lamar Jackson? We're going to talk about that. But before we do, please – Make sure you understand you have to subscribe. When you go to YouTube, we, we, we appreciate all the views, all the downloads, all the all the, the, the all the podcast uh, continuous support. But please make sure you subscribe. When you subscribe, you're going to get updates of all our podcasts, all the local stuff. So all the Vikings talk, all the wild, all the wolves, all the talk from all your local experts every single day. You're going to get instant podcasts and instant reactions after every single game, every single moment. For the NFL draft this year, you're going to get instant conversation every day after each round of the draft. We're going to have nothing but round-the-clock draft coverage every day. When you wake up, it'll be a new conversation about who the Vikings drafted, how did it work out, and what's next for that particular particular player. And make sure you continue to like, share, and comment because, of course, as you help us grow – We grow with you, and we love to interact with our fans. So please be sure to interact with us on social media, Instagram, and Twitter. And we have a word from our sponsors. Thanks, Ron. It's Built Bar. Let me tell you about Built Bar, the fastest-growing protein bar on the market. I mean, these guys are coming out with new flavors, new concepts, new ways to fuel your body all the time, and they taste so good when they do it. Uh, 100% real chocolate for all these built bars. Wonderful flavors like double chocolate, churro, um, brownie batter, just incredible flavors. You can get the puffs, you can get the granola, you can get the standard built bars. They fuel you up with like 17 grams of protein, only four grams of sugar. They're good and good for you. You can get them at built.com or in store at Walmart or Sam's, uh, Sam's Club. Go get a pack of built bars today. You'll thank me later. Well, let's talk about this Lamar Jackson because I've seen people with the pictures of him in a Vikings jersey. So I'll start out with you. It's kind of a two-parter. One, uh, Sam, what were your thoughts when Lamar Jackson decided not to play uh, for the Ravens in that game due to a knee injury? And you saw Robert Griffin have his back. You saw Michael Vick say he should have just put a brace on it and went out there for his team. You're only four games away from winning the Super Bowl. Uh, And then two, do you think there is a chance that he could become a Minnesota Viking? So number one, um, I hate to be too conspiracy theory on this, but I've, I've just got a tough time believing that this wasn't a business decision on mm-hmm. Lamar Jackson's part. And if it was, I guess I can't totally fault him. Um, I, I would blame sort of the dysfunction of the, the whole situation, not being able to come up with a deal before this. Like if this was going to be on the table, if they knew that he was going to hold out or he was going to, you know, not risk any further injury and not play in a playoff game. I wonder if that would have changed the negotiations. I wonder if they would have locked him up a year earlier. It's obviously a little messier because he's not represented by an agent. He's got his mom involved and um, probably has a lot of people in his ear. 
So tough situation for him to be in, tough for the organization. Um, I, I don't know if they can repair that relationship. I don't know how much it's been damaged. I thought it was a great relationship before. I thought he and Harbaugh were, were on the same page. They played a very specific brand of offense. Harbaugh was very aggressive. He'd go for it on fourth downs, and Lamar loved that. He's beloved by the fan base. So I don't know what really happened to this thing. Um, but I do wonder if it's beyond the point of repair, if maybe they say, we're, we're going to move on. We're going to get all we can for you. We're going to franchise tag you and trade you, and somebody else can extend you, and you can deal with them. Um, is it going to be the Vikings? I, I don't think so. Um, I don't think that Kevin O'Connell wants to scrap what they've built up offensively with mm -hmm. this scheme because I think they would have to do that. I think they would have to alter the offense completely around Lamar. Obviously, the cost would, would be enormous. I mean, they would be paying him a lot more than they're paying Kirk Cousins, I think. And I don't know if this is the point in time where you make that change. I think you need a like a true passer of the football with someone like Kirk Cousins um, to get the most out of Justin Jefferson too. And not to say Lamar can't throw, like we did see it in his MVP year. He had a nice deep ball, mm -hmm. um, but typically it's more about what he does with his legs. So I don't know if it's a perfect fit. They should have taken him in the 2018 draft. That should have been the play. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. There's two sides to every story, but when I hear Lamar's side of this whole thing, it just really feels like the bridge is burned and, and he's not going to go back to Baltimore. I think they had their opportunity because now that the Deshaun Watson trade and contract has gone through, that's the bar. Trying to trade for Lamar, like three first-round picks and what, 250 mil guaranteed? Knowing he's got that injury history, and he always will. It probably only get worse as he gets older. He's still only 26 years old, but constantly kind of hobbled and banged up. What GM out there is going to give a guy like that 250 plus guaranteed? I think your options are limited if you're Baltimore. But just from the Vikings lens in front office, I mean, of course, in this offense, it'd be like playing Madden on rookie mode, right? Like he's never came close to a supporting cast like he would have with JJ and Hawkinson and Delvin Cook and everybody else. But I I'm with Sam. I just think... The price point, especially given where the Vikings are at and Quasi are at with this current cap situation, and then the lack of draft picks on top of it. Plus, what are you going to do with Kirk? Are you just going to give him to Baltimore and hope you get a little discount? Are you going to have to wheel and deal him to a third party and hope you can get, what, two first-round picks for Kirk? He's 35 years old, needs a new contract. There's just a lot of different variables and layers that I just don't see this being more than like a 3% chance Lamar would ever end up in Minnesota. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I don't think he'd end up in Minnesota. I don't think he fits uh, because he. if you do get him in Minnesota, here's what ends up happening. You have to go back and make your team look like the Baltimore Ravens. They had the most success when they had multiple running backs. They had Lamar Jackson, and they only had one receiver. And that one receiver wanted out. Like he wanted to leave, <laughs> and he left because he felt like there was no offensive game plan to give him the ball. He felt like Lamar deferred to himself more than he did the receivers. Uh, there's video of Mark Andrews wide open in the back of the end zone, putting his hands up like, hey, throw it to me. And Lamar Jackson kind of taunting him, putting his hands up like, I'm open too. And he runs it in. Like, granted, it's it's funny on social media. Um, Lamar Jackson playing around like, hey, I'm that good that I can joke around with you mid-touchdown because they're not going to catch me. But there's something to that. When you look at that same play, if that were Pat Mahomes – as he's rolling out to his left, he's going to do some kind of weird body contortion and heave it across his body to the back of the end zone of Mark Andrews. If that's Kirk Cousins, that's for sure a throw to the back of the end zone to the tight end. Kirk's not going to try to make one guy miss and go score. Lamar said, look, there's one guy in front of me in the goal line. He's not going to tackle me. And I think that's why that wouldn't work here in Minnesota. As far as him and not playing, I'm all for it. Like the NFL could give a crap about players getting hurt. And this is the thing I say. He doesn't have a contract long-term. He has no guarantee long-term. If he were to go out like RG3 did, do, and he's a runner. If he was a straight passer, I could understand to throw a brace on it mindset. And Michael Vick, to me, is is a, is a is that was a weird, per, especially him, of all quarterbacks to say throw a brace on it. You run the ball, too. You can't run effectively with a, with a torn PCL, MCL, like or whatever it was. Like, you can't do it. Um, and so RG3 said to me, RG3 said, I went out there, I braced it up for my team. And, and everybody remembers that he's hobbling, he's limping. He makes one bad step, his knee literally buckles, and everybody gasps, like, Oh, that's gotta hurt. 
And we never really saw RG3 again. Mm -hmm. The Kirk Cousins story was born from there. Um, But when you look at RG3, he was saying, look, don't do it because that ruined my career. Like healthy, he was one of the best. RG3 was good. Like people forget that. That's why I don't understand Shady McCoy's like shade at RG3. Like, yo, you weren't that good anyway. Chill out. Like he was really good. Him and him and uh, Luck were battling back and forth. But then RG3 gets hurt. And so when you look at that, I get it. Lamar Jackson gets hurt. They're not going to pay him. Nobody's going to pay, like, at least not what he wants. He knows, look, if I'm healthy this offseason, I can cash in and, and have generational wealth. I can get $200 million probably this offseason. Why would I risk it on this one game? And we're not going to beat the Bengals anyway. And we're definitely not going to beat the Bills. We're not going to beat the Chiefs. So <laughs> I get it, Lamar. Good decision. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> no shade to the Ravens, though, but they had no shot. They hey, had they no almost shot. won. They almost won that play. No, no, I'm saying they had no shot at the Super Bowl because they were saying brace it up for four straight games. Oh, Like, you're not getting through the Bills. You're not getting through the Bills and the uh, Chiefs. Chiefs. Like, Bengals, yeah, maybe you would have won that game with Lamar because I I think what you call it said it too, like, oh, we had Lamar, we win this game, and and, uh, uh, what you call it doesn't – Huntley doesn't fumble on the Mm two-yard line. Yeah, maybe you win that game, but you're not going to beat the Bills and you're not going to beat the Chiefs. Mm -hmm. So, probably beat the Jaguars, though, but you're not beating the Bills and the Chiefs. So – it wouldn't have been worth it if he had gotten hurt. Man, that AFC, I know we know it and we talk about it all the time. That AFC is just ridiculous, isn't it? And it's just <laughs> it stacked it's for good. the next five, eight, ten years. Mm. It's, it's just good. Crazy. But don't 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 doubt these like the Eagles Giants. So quick ones, two quick ones before we get out of here. One, we're gonna do one basketball one, and then we got, I got one last football one before we get out of here. And it's gonna it's about the NFC championship game. So we're gonna focus on the NFC next week. Then we'll have the final four, so it'll be even more fun. But we're going to focus on the NFC for the last question. But before we get to the last question, I had Garrett Bush on, uh, Locked On Browns, uh, but he also has a Cleveland sports show on the Locked On Network in uh, Cleveland. Former Ohio guy. I mean, we, we realize how much of a connection we have. He played at Ohio University when I absolutely torched them. Four catches, 144 yards, and two touchdowns. I went off. Uh, we still lost the game, though. I don't know how. Our defense was could not stop the run. Uh, they threw the ball eight times, he pointed out. I had to look that up. It was true. Our defense couldn't stop the run. Uh, but Garrett Bush and I talked all after the show. We talked basketball because I'm like, man, are you a basketball guy? I know you have. And so we talked about Donovan Mitchell, Nexus. Donovan Mitchell, Rudy Gobert. There's a Nexus with Minnesota and Cleveland. So, um, And we'll have him on the show probably again. Maybe have him on the roundtable on Friday to talk basketball. But when you look at Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell, Worked well as a duo, but there was something that wasn't there. He goes to Cleveland now. He's playing carefree. He's playing loose. He's playing wild. He's dashing. He's dishing. He's scoring 100 points a game. But when you think about that, he could never put up 81 playing with Rudy Gobert. He couldn't put up big numbers like that playing with Rudy Gobert. You look at Anthony Edwards. We know what he could be. Now it seems to be a little bit stymied with Rudy Gobert's the Rudy Gobert experiment. I asked Garrett, I said, do you think Rudy Gobert was holding Donovan Mitchell back because he was trying to play a game uh, that, that a lot of this NBA doesn't even sustain anymore? When you think about the Joker, as big as he is, he's up top shooting threes. He's spreading the floor out. Rudy Gobert can't spread the floor out. So here I go with this. Do you think this Rudy Gobert thing is actually screwing up Anthony Edwards and that they need to just cut the cord at the end of this year and figure out if they can sustain any type of money or something to get guys back or I mean I wish there was a way to reverse the trade and it's again Michael J Fox cuz somebody I just saw this uh January 19th 2023 Michael J Fox Well January 19th 2023 go watch Back to the Future that was the day he arrived oh. in the future he set his DeLorean to January 19th 2023 so yesterday yesterday, michael j fox showed up somewhere in our timeline i don't know where he was at that's how old we are michael j fox came to 2023 thinking it was going to be a big difference in the world we are here now people (laughs) we are here i i I mean we have hoverboards but they don't actually hover so some too we do have the nikes that strapped themselves the cubs won the world series the cubs did win the world series they nailed it but Michael J. Fox came back. If Michael J. Fox could have come back yesterday, and we're going to make this a Back to the Future kind of a topic, would I've you have seen him... those movies too? There you go. Wow. Would you have, if you were Michael J. Fox, put yourself in Michael J. Fox's shoes, everything you know, you get to come back into 2023. Are you going to tell the Timberwolves, don't, you shouldn't have done it? 
like move on from Anthony Edwards. If you can go forward to 2024 and you kind of because you're in 2023, so you know everything that's going to happen this season. Would you go tell the Timberwolves cut ties because Anthony Edwards is is getting screwed over in this trade? But it's pretty telling when in the last couple of weeks, Rudy Gobert has been in and out of this lineup. He's been banged up. They're playing some of the best basketball without him. I know they're losing a lot of these games, but mm-hmm. I mean the way the way they went into Denver and battled the other night and led by five late and then and then screwed it up. You know, they go to New Orleans. They played them down to the wire. Um, they played the Jazz down to the wire at home on Monday. They're losing a lot of these tight games right now. But guys, it's actually pretty fun basketball to watch. Ron, you went to a clunker. You went to that Pistons game. Yep. That wasn't that wasn't great. They've been playing actually some pretty good ball against some pretty good teams, um, and they've been doing it without Gobert in a lot of these games. Now, I think that if Cat back in this mix, it would it would look a lot like last year. I think they could actually kind of channel what they had a year ago. Austin Rivers is playing better. Torian Prince is back and playing well. Get Jordan McLaughlin back in this mix for a little bit of offense, uh, you know, of just to execute the offense. I think they could actually do it. But Rudy, to me, feels like a liability. Like they're, they're just trying to shove this square peg round hole. Let's use that analogy again. It's not working that well. Um, True. So if I were Michael J. Fox and I could undo it, yeah, I would, I would say, <laughs> no, pull the plug. Pull the plug. Don't go to the, uh, the enchanted under the sea dance. <laughs> Timberwolves don't tango with he uh, has Rudy seen Gobert. the movie. Oh my god, he's gosh. watched the movie. Wow. Um, what when, when I say it, just as a basketball guy, like I said, basketball is my first love. Uh, watching basketball, and I think about every time, and, and of course, always look back to like even college teams. You think about some of the great college teams and what they had, even going back to the Kentucky team, uh, with Carl Anthony Towns, and you think about some of those teams. A lot of those teams didn't have bigs, like the big was Carl Anthony Towns, and they were dominant. Uh, the the Warriors don't have a true big. They, I mean, they they go on the floor with Draymond, Wiggins, uh, Steph, and Clay. And now, yes, they've struggled because Steph's been hurt. Clay's just coming back. Like they, uh, Draymond's been hurt. So they've had guys out. Uh, they they ask, like Andrew Wiggins cannot be your guy. Like he cannot be the main guy on the floor for multiple nights and, and get it done. Uh, he's proven that with the Timberwolves, but. What Andrew Wiggins does is he's a glue guy. He's a guy that's going to hustle. When you think about the Wolves, they don't have that glue guy anymore. Like all those guys they traded were those guys. Like those were the guys that would come. Like Austin Rivers, that that whole thing, it's not working out, it feels like to me. Uh, He's not giving you the sharpshooter that he used to be. He's not giving you the slashing score that he used to be. Um, I honestly like the trade. Instead of trading for Rudy Gobert, they should have traded for Donovan Mitchell. Like (laughs) – Forget Gobert. Go get Mitchell. Like, trade for Donovan Mitchell. You put Mitchell with Anthony Edwards and D'Lo, and then you have Cat. You literally look like the Warriors. You would look like the Warriors. Just, tr- I mean, like, you could have done that. You could have had Donovan Mitchell, Anthony Edwards, and D'Lo as a three, three guards there, and then you have Carl Anthony Towns, your four, and then you could put anybody at the five with that group. But now you look as you look just like the Warriors with Poole, uh, Clay and Curry, you put Poole, Clay and Curry against Donovan Mitchell, Edwards, and uh, D'Lo, and now you have Draymond trying to guard Cat. Now Wiggins, you probably just got to put somebody on the floor that can run with Wiggins and get up and down the court. But you, you, that's you're that team. You got scores. You got multiple scores on the floor that spread. And Carly Town spreads the floor out like Joker. That should have been the way to go. They went back in time like they were going to recreate Olajuwon and 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 whatever with uh, Ralph Sampson or they're going to David Robinson and and freaking Tim Duncan. It's not going to work. Like Tim Duncan, I hate to say this, Tim Duncan's Spurs team versus this Warriors team when they had Kevin Durant, they would run them out the gym. They would shoot them out the gym. Like it was there's no way Bank shots by Tim Duncan and and David Robinson's hook shot would keep up with Steph Curry's threes. Like, they're going to get run out the gym in a seven-game series. They lose in five. Like, that Spurs team would lose in five to that Warriors team with Kevin Durant. It's, it, it just is. what it, The NBA is going that route. So that's what the Timberwolves should have done. It's too late. If I was Michael J. Fox, yes, I would have went back. I would have stole the almanac for sure. I would have went to, the, to, 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 to whatever betting site I can get to, and I would have put all the money on every single bet 
and just been like a superhero. Uh, but I did with a ski mask on because I don't want anybody to know it was me betting. Because you're not going to come to me when I win a billion dollars in sports bets. Because <laughs> then all of a sudden I'm going to get killed by by some some dude in Vegas who uh, runs a sports book. Because um, you got the book from Back to the Future. I got the book from Back to the Future. Yep, I stole yeah. it. And yeah. for my, myself, yeah. though, myself, I gave it to myself. Like, hey, yeah. here you go, man. Take this. <laughs> Last one before we get out of here, fellas. <laughs> and people, remember, Amazon Fire and Roku. Just go to Amazon Fire and Roku. You can download the app locked on search locked on sports minnesota will be right there in your tv if you have an 80 inch tv too imagine like seeing sam's face on 80 inches of tv like come on people you got to download it like come on and especially like some nights when he has the lights out in the in the basement and the fireplace is going like oh man set the mood romantic you you can you can even mute sam and just watch his fireplace on your big 80 inch tv um but last one before we get out of here man uh, fun one for Vikings fans. If the Giants win, so this is an if question. If the Giants beat the Eagles, how pissed off are Vikings fans going to be <laughs> because they're going to realize they're going to beat the Eagles because Jalen Hurts is about to throw three interceptions. His shoulder's not right, so he's not going to be running as much. He might run and get hit and then go out the game and be hurt for the rest of the game. How pissed off are Vikings fans going to be if the Giants actually pull this off and beat the Eagles? Start with you, Sam. Well, let's remember that a win against the Giants would have given them the 49ers. And True. I don't I don't and, and yeah, what if Dallas gotten- and what if Dallas wallops the 49ers too? So throw both in there. Dallas wallops the 49ers and the Giants tear down the Eagles. Yeah. We got we yeah. got we got Giants Cowboys NFC Championship. So if the Giants win or the Cowboys win, I think I'm going to say, well, the Vikings could have never done that because because <laughs> I assume that their defense will play really well. Like I, I would assume that, oh, the Giants defense, you know, found a way to shut down Jalen Hurts. They kept him from running. Um, they covered the receivers well. If the Cowboys win, I'm going to assume that Micah Parsons got all up in Brock Purdy's grill and mm-hmm. flustered him and made him look like a rookie. And I'm probably thinking to myself, the Vikings would not have done that. So I'm not going to be upset. I'm just going to enjoy the games. Um, I'm, I hope they're competitive. I hope they're they're awesome because uh, we got some pretty good, pretty fun teams, some some throwback games here with the Niners and the, the Cowboys and the Eagles and the Giants. This is NFC football at its best. <laughs> Give yeah, me e- Pat Summerall and John Madden. EA Sports. That's what it sounded like. It's in the game. That. What you what you got, Luke? Yeah, I'm with Sam. It's kind of like what we just talked about with the Ravens, just from an outside lens looking in. Even if they beat the Bengals, nobody really has a lot of confidence they were going to go win two, three more. I don't think if the Vikings moved on to the next round, just the way you still have to play great defense and run the ball, mm-hmm. even in this pass happy league. If you want to win in the playoffs. Defense, running the ball is a prerequisite. And the Vikings just showed they just did not have that. And the Giants and the Cowboys, if they were to upset one of these two top teams, again, I think they do have what you need, those variables. They do have great defense, and they can both run the ball, whether it's Barkley and Jones or whether it's Zeke and Pollard with a little Dak Prescott in there as well. If either of those happens, good on them. I'll pat them on the back. Vikings wouldn't have been able to do that, not with that defense. Here's where I'm going to go with it. Vikings fans are going to be pissed off. If the Eagles lose and the 49ers lose, Vikings fans are going to be pissed off. I do know there's going to be some some real ones like Sam who will take in the perspective of, oh, the Vikings defense can never do that. It might just be an onslaught of offensive back and forth, slugger not, you know, slug fest. And in the end, it's going to come down to one team making a big play and the Giants are going to get another helmet catch. David Tyree, friend of our show. Mm-hmm. And the Cowboys are going to get another some kind of like Des Bryant redemption catch. Like I, I feel like CeeDee Lamb will catch it. He'll take two steps. He'll about to fall and oh, he flips his arm over. It hits the ground, bounces up, and he still catches it. Touchdown. Redeems himself. Des Bryant tweets out. It was a catch in Green Bay too. Cowboys beat the 49ers. And Vikings fans are going to look at that and say, that could have been us. We could have easily went toe-to-toe with the 49ers and the Eagles if our defense could have held the Giants just to a little bit of a semblance of a defense and shown up. Um, I, I think that's where Vikings fans, they're always going to find a way to be pissed, regardless. Now, if the Eagles blow out the Giants and if the 49ers just demolish the Cowboys, I think Vikings fans will sleep a lot easier. They will be like, you know what? 
Thank God this is not us Sunday because we would have gotten absolutely like if the Cowboys get run over and if the Giants get run over, oh my goodness, Vikings fans will be like, we would have got destroyed. Last fun one, 30 seconds, fellas. Quick twitch. Uh, let's 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 get help the mouths water of our fans. What are you guys gonna have uh football Sunday? What, what's on the what's on the menu for you, Sam? Menu for me is um, I'm going to go over and announce a college hockey game, <laughs> and I will miss most of the action. So that's my menu. So no food for you. Luke, what you nope. got? No food uh, for me. W- we got to start with some pizza, and then we got to get those wings in the air fryer. Maybe we pick okay. up a little beat-up sauce or some hot sauce, buffalo sauce. Make sure you get your ranch and blue cheese going on. Uh, those are going to be the two staples. Maybe you might try a little wild card, like some potato skins or something else. Mm. But those are going to be the two staples for sure. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm doing the twice baked potato skins. I like that with the bacon and cheese, it, like, like rolled into it, so it's in the in the in the mashed potato part. You put it in and you mm. rebake them, mm. uh, and then you put more sour cream and cheese on top with more bacon. Uh, we're gonna have the wings for sure with some like deep fried though. I'm, I'm getting the deep fryer out. We're putting real deep fried breading on it, uh, and then not sure how many people we're inviting i know super bowl we're going to do something so it's going to be a lot more for super bowl i think we're going to keep it to like the wings and the b- potatoes and then probably loaded fries because i know my kids don't always like potato skins so we got to get some fries for them yeah i think that's what we're going to do it, it's going to be a fun one we have a uh, of course volleyball and softball all day on saturday but sunday get to sit back and watch some football i want to thank everybody that continues to like share download comment watch support us we are extremely thankful for all of your support we are this is year one Covering Vikings football, we're going to continue to grow. We're going to be with you all year, though. We're not going anywhere. We're going to be with you all year. We're going to cover all the sports, football, Super Bowl, all that. We still have a lot to go. Stick with us, but have a great weekend, and thank you.